first wave, we're almost done actually uh, with this uh, parametric stuff. Um, so we finished this morning with um, uh, these predictors or linear predictors in the, in the interior point method context. So essentially it's just about uh, using the primal dual interior point KGD conditions um, as the set of equations that support um, the solution of your problem. And then you look at uh, all these variables, w, lambda, mu, and s, as the uh, implicit function of the parameters. And we just apply the uh, implicit function theorem. Uh, then you can, again, do path-following style stuff in interior point methods. Um, now we have a bit of a trade-off that uh, kicks in between uh, or when doing these things. Um, when you use a tau that is fairly large, for example, then the, the manifold of the solution is, uh, is quite smooth. Here you don't have this sharp corner, you have a fairly nice turn. But then the solution you get is not uh, <coughs> extremely accurate, so the optimal solution is going down here, and you'll basically relax it into this uh, thing here. But then the, the manifold is easy to follow because it does not have these sharp turns. And if you work at very low tau's, then you capture this, uh, these sharp terms very well. For a very small <coughs> tau, your, uh, your uh, smoothing is non not even visible. Uh, but then it's hard to follow this, uh, these sharp turns. Um, okay, so if we apply uh, path-following methods in this context, uh, you could have stuff like that. Um, and um, yeah, so that's the prediction if you move from this parameter to that one. Linear prediction here and the true solution is there. Um, so when you get through the curve, uh, you have a bit of a difference between the predictor and the, and the true solution manifold, but it's not dramatic. If you do it uh, if on this uh, uh, manifold with a very small tau, then you may actually, uh, when you get there, have this uh, effect that the prediction is pretty seriously wrong here. So in that sense, you don't have this uh, th this effect that we had from the QP, where you actually see the corner. Um, but you can apply these techniques and do, uh, uh, again, prediction correction techniques. So here again, so the prediction is this guy. So if I change P, how will the solution be affected? And the correction is this guy. Uh, it's essentially, if my KKD conditions, this big R, are not completely satisfied, how should I correct Z, so the primal dual variables, in order to improve that? So when R is zero, you don't have any correction. That means you are on the solution manifold. And if you don't have any delta P, you don't have any correction due to changing the parameters. And again, you can blend these two things together uh, and have a delta Z that comes from a mix of uh, predictions and corrections. Uh, so that could be a path flowing into a point algorithm. So you receive at, at every round um, a new parameter P plus and you have the old solution. You check how the parameters is changing. So you have this delta P and you form this uh, update based on, uh, on uh, here that will be a Newton step on the KGD conditions and here a prediction step um, based on how delta P has changed. And the rest is the same. You may want to step size. You have to monitor that S and mu are not uh, getting the wrong sign and you may yeah, backtrack uh, on your step size. But uh, if you deploy these kind of things, you will uh, see something like this here. I'm trying to follow the red manifold and uh, it's not doing too bad. You have to think that you take a single Newton step in between every change in the parameters. So again, you're moving fast through a manifold and you kind of uh, have a pretty decent uh, following of that manifold. Here, if you uh, go for the more accurate manifold, you have a pretty sharp turn and it's a bit harder to uh, to uh, catch this corner. So you see that here, the algorithm is kind of oscillating around the manifold for two steps and then it recovers so it's still uh, getting back there but it was a bit hard to go through this 
So ideally here you should, uh, uh, if you can control how the parameter is changing, you should uh, try to change it a bit slower around these things. Um, but um, otherwise you're, ha you're left, or you have to deal with that. Um, yeah, maybe just a comparison um, between the two approaches we saw for path following. So that's for interview points methods, and that's the SQP style method where we had the QP forming uh, corrections and predictions. And uh, you can compare the two, and we've done that in some examples, but essentially what happens is that uh, this guy is a bit more effective at following uh, the, uh, the manifold, at least if you want to work with the corners, because the QP is capable of uh, detecting and navigating these corners. Uh, but the price you pay is that you have to solve a QP at every of this round. So this is uh, fairly expensive typically to solve, even though you can do it in milliseconds often, but uh, it would still be considered as an expensive operation. On that side, uh, you have this problem that if you want to your manifold to be very accurate, so you want to work with a very small tau, uh, then it's a bit hard to go through these corners. At the same time, uh, you can do this really fast because that's only solving a linear system in some sense. We'd have to form these matrices, but then it's, uh, you just have to deal with these matrix factorizations, uh, which, is not, uh, which is cheaper than solving the QP. The QP would typically do a number of these uh, operations. Um, so this loop could run in principle much faster than, uh, than this one. And if P is changing with physical time, uh, you could probably sample this uh, code much quicker and uh, then the changes in P would be smaller. Okay with that? Um, yeah, maybe one thing that you can do when uh, doing path following on interview point methods, and some people do that, obviously, is uh, you do your path following on this uh, relaxed path. So each of these points will serve as an initial guess for the next, uh, for building the next point. But then you do a few more iterations to bring uh, tau down. So you take these points from the uh, prediction correction algorithm and then you converge tau and you go down to this uh, manifold. But then to build the next point, you will reuse this point here on the relaxed manifold. So go here converge tau and gets to the accurate manifold and so on and so forth. So we'll be forming the prediction correction at a larger tau and then uh, get the accurate solution by doing a few more steps um, and converging tau. So there are some uh, MPC techniques that uh, are based on doing that. Yeah, okay, that's a wrap up. Um, yeah, right. Um, I just wanted to, after all this theory, show you an example of application of these techniques. And here I'll talk about bi level optimization, really. Uh, and that's one uh, example where we use uh, sensitivity based techniques. And all these things that I discussed, we use them in uh, fairly elaborate ways to uh, solve this problem in, uh, in our own way. Um, so it's about autonomous driving. Many people are working on that, obviously. And uh, what we have tried to do here is so resolve the intersection problem. So we, you have a number of cars trying to uh, use this common space uh, or conflict on this common space. They have to go through an in intersection and decide who goes first. Um, there are studies showing that if you can get rid of the red lights, uh, you can save up to 25% fuels fuel in cities, so that's a big difference. You can also speed up the traffic. Um, so the idea is to not stop the cars at all, but uh, somehow optimize uh, their trajectories. It's mostly about how fast they'll uh, drive on their path uh, in order to get all the cars through the intersection and, um, and not have any collision. So that's what we want to do. Uh, well, these are the goals. Uh, what we wanted is that uh, the cars do most of the computations for doing that. So they are the decision makers. And uh, to have only a little bit of uh, communication 
uh, between the cars or actually in what we did here uh, between the cars and some uh, coordination computer something that could be uh, sitting at the, the intersection uh, obviously safe and robust algorithm so that's how we approached uh, the problem so you essentially see the cars as here like three systems you can have a lot more obviously um, and they would talk a little bit to a coordinator that would uh, communicate back with the cars and, uh, and make some decisions on how to organize the crossing. So that's what we did here. So the cars are running uh, uh, MPC schemes in order to uh, drive through their pathways and sort of constraints on the speed and uh, accelerations and all these things. Um, and they will negotiate uh, their entry and exit time in this uh, common space uh, with the coordinator. So essentially each car is solving MPC with a assigned time for entering and leaving the intersection. And the times are decided by the, the coordinator. And of course they are decided such that uh, cars are not in this space at the same time. But then you don't want to uh, dictate the cars what the entry and exit time should be. They, the cars should essentially talk uh, all together to decide what is optimum for everyone to do something. So maybe one car should speed up a little bit and one car should slow down a little bit and, uh, and do that in a way that, uh, for example, you save as much fuel as possible. And everything has to happen on the fly. So you cannot stop the cars to do com uh, computations and then, and then start the game. So as the cars come in, they should contact the coordinator uh, tell it that okay now I'm in the game and uh, now you need to resolve all these times as the cars are driving towards the intersection with feasible solutions at all times and the way we uh, approach the problem is uh, by level optimization so you can think of uh, each car as running its own MPC and that's essentially an NLP in each car uh, you have uh, the dynamics and some inequality constraints and everything. So the classical stuff. So that will be car one, maybe. And you have uh, a number of these guys. <coughs> and the P1, for example, that will be uh, at what time you enter and leave the intersection. So T out and T in for this car. And so if the car receives or gets assigned an entry and exit time, it can solve the optimal control problem. So how can I go through the intersection safely, minimizing fuel and so on, provided that uh, I have to achieve these timings. And then at the, uh, you can think of uh, this as a function for car one. So the minimum of that problem, what is the performance that car one would achieve with these times? That's his function of these times. And really, that's the, the, the value function you have uh, for this car. And then at the intersection problem, um, what you care about is to minimize the, the, the cost for everyone. So you can think of this as I need to minimize over all the crossing time for all the cars I have. I should minimize um, <coughs> the cost that this uh, um, crossing times have. So minimize that and of course you have the constraint that uh, you cannot have a collision obviously. So you can manipulate these crossing times but uh, the car that precedes another car must leave before the previous one enters. So it's bi-level optimization. Uh, the cars are running or solving these problems. And they are returning to the, uh, the intersection problem, basically the gradient and hessian of this function. And then the, the, at this intersection problem, you are also running an NLP. So you want to solve this problem and you get uh, second order approximations of the problem. And you can take SQP steps on that problem. So you have bi-level. That happens at the car level, at the intersection level. And everything happens on the fly using the techniques I showed before um, and uh, it works pretty well. 
We tried this in simulations and that was working very nicely. So we ended up uh, doing experiments. So here that's the common space that the cars will share. You have one car here, one car over there, and one car here approaching. And they are put on a collision course. So they have to, uh, they have to resolve the conflict. So you see one stopped car here. The computer is there for resolving the conflicts. The communication was done through uh, some very basic Wi-Fi. So I was uh, actually the bottleneck in the experiments. So here we used uh, very uh, robust safety margins. Um, so what we did is when uh, this car leaves the intersection, so the back is here. This, the, the bottom, the top of the car here should be there. So these lines are marking the uh, safety margins. So same here and here. So you have a car coming from that side, intersecting with two cars on the same lane. So just to show you that uh, you can do really cool stuff with this mathematics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what are the individual cost functions? Um, okay, in these experiments, we use something very simple. It was basically tracking uh, reference speed. So deviating from like, uh, they were like, the reference was 50 kilometers per hour here. So that's what we had. Uh, but then we uh, published in some papers more elaborate cost functions like fuel saving uh, including um, um, different types of engine, electric, fuel-based, hybrid, uh, and uh, yeah, using complete engine maps, and it, it still works the same. Just use say fuel then rather than just sticking to a speed. So the intersection minimum would be where all the cars were closest to their reference speed. In the experiments, yeah. So they want to stick to 50. Uh, which, I mean, if you looked very, very carefully at the experience, probably you missed that. But there is one instance where the car, when it, once it has left the intersection, it's braking. <laughs> and it should not do that from fuel efficiency. You should just let it glide. Uh, but 50 was a reference speed. So it was like speeding up to go through and then braking to, uh, to get back to 50. Uh, when you do energy-based uh, optimization, it does not brake at all. It will just uh, let it glide, for example. So if you had different engines in different cars, would then, like the electric car would go, would break and then... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or a more extreme situation, if you have a truck versus cars, the truck, because of so much energy is involved, would tend to uh, have the priority to uh, not break much. Wow. How did you deal with uh, local minima? We did not. Um, it, it's, uh, it does not seem to be a problem here. So that, that's an interesting remark in practice with uh, all non-convex optimization. Of course, you always have this question behind. But if you initialize your problems in a good way, you typically don't have these issues. Did so you initialize it with a certain uh, sequence of cars? Yeah, so in that, exactly. So in that case, the, the, the ordering of the crossing was fixed. Uh, so you first lock that and then you optimize in that ordering. Um, so that, is that what you mean by local minimum? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, then it's more about the uh, integer part of the problem, how you resolve that. So that's what we did here. And then, uh, yeah, we now have a paper that also proposes ways of uh, solving the, uh, this ordering aspect very quickly. If you want to do it properly, like with uh, complete mixed integer programming, that's quite nasty. But um, it turns out that the ordering at the end is fairly kind of self-obvious to some extent. And uh, you can reach optimality or close to optimality with very little computations. 
Um, and one way of initializing the, the, the crossing times is uh, just ask the cars what would be your preferred crossing times. If I was, if you had no conflict with other cars, where, when would you want to cross? And then you use that as a starting uh, point for uh, solving the problem. Um, another aspect is if, if the optimization starts uh, long enough before the car arrives to the intersection, like a few hundred meters, then the whole problem becomes a lot easier because the car has time to adjust um, the, 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 the timings. Uh, if you were to start like 50 meters before, you may even reach invisibility at some point. Um, so that's that's the um, the bottom line here. So the ordering was fixed in your experiment, right? In the experiment, it was fixed, and uh, in simulations, we have shown that uh, you have simple ways of designing the order that uh, are very close to the uh, the uh, mixed integer programming solution. So, so if electric small electric car comes to intersection one second before a large truck. Would then the only solution be that the electric car speeds up, or could it also break down? It, there, you may have a switch there. Okay. But so uh, again, uh, the, the solution should be computed a little bit before you get to this point. So typically, like the truck and the car are uh, like 20, 30 seconds from crossing, and you start talking at this stage. Yeah, but it can manage to like even though the um, electric car will hit the intersection first, it can manage to figure out that the electric car should break and take the intersection second, or? Yeah, yeah, so you may have the two solutions that it's, it really slows down or accelerate depending on the ordering, and uh, yeah. Yeah, but it can manage the ordering, kind of? If you s resolve the integer part, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But like in your results so far? Uh, yes, in uh, latest results, yeah. yeah. We yeah. saw that also, yeah, yeah. So what information uh, the car need to change to each other? Uh, that's a good question. So, um, so in these experiments, the cars don't talk to each other. They talk to the, uh, the uh, coordinator. Um, and the information the cars communicate is uh, they have this uh, value function, each of them, and they communicate the gradient and hessian of this function. So you're talking about uh, six numbers per car, essentially. So <coughs> this is a real number, right? Yeah. And you have two parameters for each car. Uh, and so the gradient of V is in R2 and the Hessian of V is in R2 by 2, right? So vector matrix. So you have six numbers that the car must give to the crossing, uh, to the coordinator. Um, the coordinator would do some very light computations, actually. The work here is, uh, is not very big. And then it broadcasts the crossing times to the cars. So each car will receive uh, a cross new crossing times with a signature and, uh, and resolve the problem on their side. And if you want to re-optimize the crossing times, um, you would do one more round and so on. So in the experiments, most, uh, in most cases, the after two, three, uh, back and forth, the crossing <coughs> times were not changing anymore. Um, and you, we did some tests where uh, you, you let the algorithm converge and then one of the driver like, was stepping on the brake, like completely disturbing the problem. And then you have a few more exchanges when the times are readjusted and then uh, it works again. Fine. Um, yeah, and having said that, so that's the structure we chose mostly for simplicity. But you can actually, if you go deep inside the math, you realize that you can actually also solve the problem without any coordinator and then you need essentially some kind of round communication between the cars. So you can do all this work uh, completely decentralized but it's a bit harder to organize. And our, uh, our take is that uh, in, a, in a future uh, urban situation you may actually have this kind of infrastructure. It would make sense to uh, have something like that. So that, that's our vision of the problem at least. Okay with that? Yeah? All right. Um, okay, we can move to the next chapter. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a bit of a side topic as well, but um, I think it may be useful for some. 
Um, so uh, only one lecture on this. Sometimes we give a full course on these topics, but hopefully we can get uh, at least to the surface of that. So do you all know what DAs are? Different charge break equation. Okay, I'll explain that a little bit. And does everyone know what SO3 is? Yeah, that's more common, right? Special, Special orthogonal Lie group, <laughs> which is a big name for talking about rotations. Right, so if you play with UAVs, uh, you're actually playing with these problems. Um, okay. Um, okay, why do we use DAs first? Uh, I'll explain what they are, but maybe I can sh first say why we use them. You mostly find them in two contexts. One is when you have extremely large systems. I'm talking about like, I don't know, large distillation plants with a number of distillation columns and stages and everything. And in that context, uh, no one wants to write uh, an OD with uh, 2,500 states somewhere in a computer and, and deal with this equation. So what happens is that you have different teams dedicated to writing models for different parts of the system. But at the end of the day, the plant is a, is a meta system. All these things are connected. So you need to connect these models together. And what people typically do is use ODEs to describe their subsystems. And then they have typically flows or uh, yeah, algebraic variables that tell how this system will uh, interact with the environments. So yeah, balance equations, flows, and so on, maybe heat. Uh, and then you connect these subsystem uh, systems via algebraic relationships that describe, for example, the flow of that system and the heat of that system is connected to the flow and heat of that one via this equation. Then your, uh, the model becomes what we call a differential algebraic equation model, but then it becomes a lot easier to, uh, to develop, maintain and modify if needed. Then if you had all these equations packed in, uh, in one place, um, you find the same problems in, uh, in uh, complex circuits. Uh, people also use DAs in that context quite uh, happily. Another example is uh, complex robotic systems. Uh, there are uh, existing robots that operate in the industry that are a nightmare to describe via ODEs, and they are super simple to describe via DAs, so people uh, then tend to use these type of approaches. Uh, yeah, and you often get more natural representations of the system. So I'll show you uh, an example. Oh yeah, that's an example of robots. I don't know if you've seen this guy before, the Delta robot. Try to model this guy via uh, classic uh, ODEs. You'll just uh, bang your head on the wall. But if you use a DE approach, it's very simple. For all uh, Say it again. Um, yeah, I guess I would say that, yeah, probably, that's, uh, but not, not only for the closed links. Uh, you have uh, open link structures where it's also easier to work with DAs. Um, I'll show you at the end uh, an actual example of systems. Uh, it's not the robot, but it's a system that, uh, where DAs are a lot easier to use. Okay, so just if you never heard about DAs, it's good to uh, put a bit of formalism behind. So. Um, we can think of a differential equation uh, with a slight twist. I will not write it in that way, but I will actually write an equation that provides um, x dot, not directly as a function of x u, but implicitly via a set of equations, right? Um, a stupid example of that would be to write uh, this, right? That will be a, a very simple example. But you have models where um, um, this happens differently. One example would be if you have some matrix times x dot uh, plus, say, another matrix. Um, and if Inverting this matrix here, E of x, is uh, difficult, then uh, it's better to treat the system <coughs> in this form here. <coughs> this, this would be called an implicit ODE. And it becomes a DAE if del f del x dot is rank deficient. So if you take the Jacobian of f with respect to x dot. 
And there is actually uh, an easy interpretation of what this means. Uh, if you think about Newton again and the implicit function theorem. So if del f del x is for rank, x dot, sorry, is for rank, then it's uh, possible to solve these implicit equations for x dot. So you could, for example, apply Newton on finding x dot, and you would find a solution. But if del f del, f del x dot is rank deficient, then you cannot do that. And uh, you could not solve these equations for x dot. So if you don't know what x dot is, you don't know where the system is going, and you have a problem. So some examples would be uh, if you have a linear DA, uh, they're often written that way. And you, the twist is that you have a matrix E multiplying x dot. If that guy is rank deficient, um, <coughs> then you don't have an OD, you have a DA. Um, a simple example of DAEs is that uh, some of your x's don't appear as time differentiated. So some of the xi's don't appear in the x dot i form. Uh, in that case, this becomes uh, by construction rank deficient. You would have um, columns of zeros in del f del x dot. So if you have this configuration as the most common one, uh, variables that don't appear time differentiated, then you rename them z in the equations. That allows you to get uh, to make a clear dif distinction between uh, those var <coughs> variables that appear time differentiated and those that don't appear time differentiated. But all these guys are states. Okay with that? Uh, you have some annoying cases, even DAs that can switch between OD and DAs depending on the states and inputs, but people don't play that much with that in practice. Um, here is an example of uh, a classic form of DAs called semi-explicit, where you essentially have an OD part uh, depending on Z, and Z is implicitly given by some uh, algebraic equations, function of X, possibly the inputs, and Z. So you should be able to solve this for z, maybe not on pen and paper, but numerically at least, and then inject the z in here, and then that gives you x dot. So in that sense, you could look at it as some kind of OD with some extra variables z that you need to resolve uh, all the time. You have to think of g as possibly functions you cannot solve by hand. Um, People like working with this form also because any, any uh, DAE can be transformed or put in this form here. Um, so that's a, that's a useful form. Okay, here is an example of a DAE in practice. And I'm not saying that this is the right way of approaching this problem, but at least that shows you how DAEs can uh, uh, pop up. So imagine you want to model this, uh, the, the, the evolution of this mass uh, that uh, pivots around this uh, this point here, right? So essentially, it, it's a pendulum, right? Something like this. And um, obviously, or the most common uh, or reflex people would have is you set up some angles, and then you write uh, your problem in spherical coordinates. Um, and then you get signs and costs all over the place. It's very ugly and not easy to work with. It's one way of solving the problem. Here's another version that uh, gives a DA in the end, but you get very trivial equations. So what you do is uh, you describe the motion of your mass here, ignoring that there is this link. So that would look like if P is my position, you get mass times acceleration equals maybe some force. U would be a force acting on the mass. And then you have gravity, so mg <coughs> is 3. So is 3 would be the vector. Uh, pointing up, <coughs> right? So that will be describing the mass basically free falling. Okay, now we need to do something about this link because the mass is not free falling. And what we can do essentially is say, well, what I know about this link is that it will exert a force on the on the mass that will be uh, along the link, right? It can only pull or push on the on the mass. So essentially, this force is uh, of vector p. And then I don't know the magnitude of the force, so I'll basically introduce a scaling factor z on this force that can make it uh, bigger, or smaller, or negative, right? And then uh, this uh, force basically enters in this equation. 
right? Uh, so now I have this variable z, and of course that's going to be an algebraic variable, that's where it's going. Uh, and I need to somehow decide what this z should be. And the only thing I know is that um, the mass should be at a constant distance L from the origin. So essentially z will be adjusted <coughs> all the time, such that a uh, constraint of that form is satisfied. For example, uh, p transpose p, so that's the square norm of p minus L square is zero, right? Does it make sense? Yeah. All right, so I have an ODE with Z and I have a constraint with uh, C. I can rewrite this stuff a little bit. So I introduce some extra variables V for P dot, so that I have first order uh, dynamics. So P dot equals V, V dot equals this equation divided by M, and I have this extra constraint, okay? And that's a DE. I have some uh, differential variables p dot and v dot, that's going to be, be my x dots. And I have uh, an algebraic variable z, and I have some uh, algebraic equations. And that's actually describing the dynamics of my pendulum. No sign and cos, no big stuff. You can write this in a very compact form. Mm -hmm. So what kind of d is that? Uh, it's a semi-explicit. You have uh, no d part function of uh, x, x would be uh, p and v, uh, function of z. And then you have an algebraic equation, which depends only on x, actually only on p on this case. So this guy here, would you call it g of x? It's independent of z, okay? Um, now we have a little bit of a problem here, actually, uh, with a d in this form, because uh, I would not know how to select Z. Um, I know that I should pick Z such that this guy holds, uh, but I don't, cannot solve this guy for Z. Z does not even appear in here, so I would not know what to do. And I need to know what Z is. Uh, in principle, this algebraic equation should deliver Z, but they don't in this case. So we have nice equations, but we're still a bit stuck. Uh, the problem here has to do with something called the differential index of uh, the DAE and the solution is called index reduction and it's not as complicated as it sounds. Um, the differential index is the number of times you need to differentiate your uh, DAEs with respect to time until you get a pure ODE. So you can imagine a bit the process whenever you differentiate your equations <coughs> this Z that does not appear time differentiated somehow at some point Z dots will appear right and once the z dot appears, you could look at them as uh, algebra, as uh, differential variables. So at some point, you can imagine that an OD will uh, pop up. Okay, this procedure can be very nasty if you have complex DAs, but in our simple example here, it's going to be quite easy. Um, so I'm kind of happy about this guy here. That's already an ODE, so I should probably not touch it. Um, but I have these algebraic equations with which I'm a little bit stuck. They don't give me Z. So I can try this stunt here. I will time differentiate 1B uh, with respect to time. I actually differentiate twice. That's my G dot dot if you want. And you can verify that if you differentiate that twice, you get P, P dot dot, P dot transpose, P dot. And then I have a p dot dot that appears. I could plug my p dot dot from here in here. And um, uh, yeah, I can assemble this actually, just rewriting the equation. Um, yeah, actually, okay, I'll jump directly here. Um, here is what you can do with this. You write the two equations together and you can assemble them uh, just in a matrix form. I'm just rewriting these two equations as matrix times p dot dot z, and I put these guys on the other side. And now actually it turns out that well, this matrix, uh, if it's full rank, I can solve this linear system for p dot dot and z. So now by this small transformation, I have turned these equations that don't give me z uh, into equations that give me z and also p dot dot. Does it make sense? Um, so it I have solved my problem essentially here. Um, 
Because equation two, I can solve it for p dot dot z, uh, as least as long as this matrix is full rank. <coughs> and um, yeah, I should be happy with that. If you time differentiate this guy once more, you would actually get your pure OD because you will make uh, z dot appear. Um, so you can conclude from that that we have to differentiate twice here to get to this, differentiate once more, we will get a pure OD. So this model here was of index 3 in the first place, according to that definition. And this model here, I well, would have to differentiate it once to make z dot appear. So this one is of index 1, one time differentiation to get an OD. And this model too is easy to handle. If I get, if I know p and, and u and p dot, so my state and my inputs, <coughs> I can compute the accelerations and z. So I can compute my p dots and my z. So it would be in principle easy to uh, uh, integrate or simulate that system. <coughs> yeah. Um, that's actually one, uh, it would take more time to unpack this properly, but uh, index 1 DAs are easy to treat. So they give you x dot and z at any point. Uh, you can integrate them uh, easily. And in the semi-explicit form, uh, you have an index 1 when del g del z is full rank, which essentially means I can solve this uh, equation for z. <coughs> Okay with that? Not too hard, yeah? Okay, now what we did from going to here to there is called an index reduction. So that model was index 3 and I went down to index 1. This one was tricky to solve, I don't know how to get z. This one is easy, I know how to get z, I just solve this linear system. So going from index 3 to index 1 or any index to index 1 is called an index reduction. You reduce the index, that's the philosophy, and you always do that by uh, time differentiations. Um, people don't like to work with high index DA, so index above one, uh, because it's uh, quite nasty to treat numerically. So that's the most common way of uh, treating these DAs. But now you s still see, I mean, <coughs> this uh, pendulum problem, I mean, you can imagine maybe if you use uh, angles to describe the problem, you will have very quickly quite nasty stuff. Here, even with this index reduction, I have a fairly simple model describing uh, the dynamics of my pendulum. So that, that's it. I can describe my uh, pendulum using these equations and, and integrate, simulate the pendulum using that. Okay, now there is one question to still discuss. So that's the equation describing my pendulum and I did my index reduction and I got these equations here. So my pendulum, if I simulate these equations, somehow, I s let's suppose I manage to do that, I get this, uh, these nice oscillations, right? That's what the pendulum is supposed to do. Um, if I simulate these equations, I will just do it a bit naively, I get that. Hmm. Why is that so? Any idea? Hmm? We have lost the information of L somehow? Yeah, actually, yeah, pretty much, yeah. Any idea how we lost it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's pretty much it. So we lost information. Why? Because this model is imposing this constraint here. So essentially, saying the position should be at distance l from the origin, and then we time differentiated this constraint twice. So instead of imposing c equals to zero, and let's call this guy c, uh, I'm imposing c dot dot equals to zero. Uh, so of course a very different thing to impose, right? Uh, imposing the second order derivative of something being zero as opposed to that. And obviously if this guy is, uh, holds at every time, that would imply that this guy holds at every time. If C is not moving, then it does not have any acceleration. But the converse is not necessarily <coughs> true, right? So that's how you get this kind of effect. It's easy to fix, um, so it happened via the index reduction. We want to impose that and we impose that instead. <coughs> yeah, 
So these equations are uh, basically built to impose C dot dot equals to zero, not C. So it does not ensure that these guys, C and C dot, equal to zero. Do you see how to fix that? Yeah, kind of. So you get that, huh? just uh, to finish the story. Here in my simulation, I, uh, by, by mistake, uh, did not choose the initial conditions properly and C dot was not zero at time zero. And then C is essentially drifting away according to that. How to address that? Um, it's fairly simple. Um, Um, if you impose that c and c dot are zero at any time you want on the trajectory and the equations impose c dot dot is zero, then they will hold at any time. I don't know if that's obvious for you or not. So c is not accelerating. Just say that c is also zero, for example, at time zero and c dot is zero. And then c dot dot is zero by the model equations, then c will remain zero all the time. All right. So when you do index reductions on DAEs, you always need to provide uh, so-called consistency conditions. So essentially algebraic conditions that will ensure that uh, the reduced DAE still uh, matches the, the, the true one. So the one you are describing the physics. So in our case, it's interesting that you choose the initial conditions, for example, such that the mass is at the right distance and that the velocity of the mass is orthogonal to the link. Essentially, that's what you were asking. And these conditions pop up uh, during the uh, re uh, index reduction phase. If you do that, you impose these conditions, <coughs> then everything works fine. OK, so we'll take a break, and then I'll discuss a little bit how you manipulate these DAs in optimal control. <coughs> 